so Rosalinda is about 14 when I meet her. She has clear brown skin and thick black hair and eyes so pretty that even when she's got a bandana over her face in the fields, you can tell that she's beautiful. Inez is also 14, same brown skin, thick black hair, but her eyes aren't as pretty and her smile's not as wide. And these two girls changed my life forever. I meet Inez at her house where I live with her two parents, her two brothers, her two sisters, a family with two parents, an infant and a toddler, and four or five guys that live in the garage. We share a bathroom and a kitchen, both of which are exceptionally clean. And the best thing about where I live is the food. I have fish stew with chili and lime, Mexican rice with tomato and onion, a lot of mole coming out of jars of Doña Maria because even farm workers need some convenience. But what is the best thing in the kitchen are the big stacks of flour tortillas that come with every meal. And this food is important to me not just because it's delicious, but because I'm working in the field as a reporter. And every time when I go to the field and come home, I'm very hungry. And the fields are where I meet Rosalinda. She comes up to me my first day in the garlic field, plops down her buckets in the dirt, and starts asking me questions. What's your name? Where are you from? Where's your family from? Why are you here? Everyone always asks me this, why are you a white girl with papers here? And I answer her the same way I always answer. And I say, um, tengo muchos problemas y no quiero hablar de eso. I have a lot of problems. I don't want to talk about it. This is a pretty big conversation stopper, as you might imagine. And with Rosalinda, I'm stuck because she's 14 and I can't remember how it is that you're supposed to talk to a teenager. And so I sort of go back into my brain and pull out a question that I'm fairly certain I must have gotten from a teen magazine about going on a first date. And I say, so Rosalinda, what kind of music do you listen to? And she looks at me a little bit like I'm crazy and primly replies, mostly Christian music. And in my head, I'm like, oh, of course, Tracy, why would you think that she listens to anything else? It's an indigenous migrant from Mexico, very traditional, very traditional. Okay, and we go back to cutting our garlic. The garlic has long, papery stalks dried out in the sun and bleached to white, and it's so long that you can braid them together. And traditionally, that's how communities have harvested garlic. You pull it out of the ground, you braid it, and you hang it in a barn to dry because if it gets wet, it will rot. But we're in California in 2009, and nobody is worried about there being too much water. When the farmer is done with growing the garlic, machines come into the field and just cut underneath to loosen it from the soil. And then crews of men come in, walking through fields that are a half mile by a half mile, one row every 15 or 20 feet, so that if you laid them all end to end, you would walk for 60 miles. And they come in, bent over at the waist, and pull the garlic out of the ground, and then lay it out to dry. And that's when people like Rosalinda and I and the other pickers come in. We cut off the thatch of root at the base, we snip off the stalk, and we drop a head of garlic into a bucket that is five gallons large. For every bucket that we fill, we earn $1.60. On my first day, I fill 10. Rosalinda, 7. We are there for nine hours. My coworkers tell me that every bucket weighs about 25 pounds. So I know that on my first day, I made $1.80, and Rosalinda made $1.25, but we earn the same as everybody else per pound, which is 6 cents. When I see the same company's garlic for sale at Walmart six months later, they are charging $3.38. But I don't know any of this on my first day in the fields. I go home and I tell Inez that I met somebody her age, and I ask if she knows her, and she looks at me a little bit confused, and she says she doesn't go out very much. She cooks and she cleans, and as she puts a big sack of flour tortillas on the table, she tells me she wishes she could go work in the fields instead. So I'm spending more time with the families, I go and I hang out with Rosalinda's parents who pick garlic too, and we, we start sharing rides to the fields, we start eating together, and I start to learn about their lives. And Rosalinda tells me that she wants to go on and go to college, and she wants to be a translator for families like hers. 
And her parents tell me that they'd rather she be a nurse because they hear that that's a good job. When I try to have the same conversation with Inez's family, it goes differently. She's here to cook and to clean, and though nobody tells me directly, I figure out they're expecting her to get married pretty soon. She doesn't go to school here. She's been learning how to make tortillas since she was 10. And so when I figure this out, I get really upset. I get very angry. I feel very humbled. I feel very sad. But mostly what I feel is alone because suddenly I have a concrete example of the vast chasm that, ex that separates my experience from that of my friends. And I kind of freak out about this a bit. You know, I try calling home and explaining to people in Brooklyn or in Michigan what this feels like, and not surprisingly, nobody really seems to identify with my experience. But a few days go by, and then something happens to help me level out. It's lunchtime in the garlic fields, and Rosalinda's dad decides he's going to work through lunch because they need the extra money, and he sends Rosalinda off to eat lunch in the car. And I follow a few minutes later, and as I am walking up to the car, I see that her window's open, she's sitting in the passenger seat, and she's eating, and there's, some, there's a sound that I hear that really surprises me. If you having girl problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but a bitch ain't one. I got the and so I say, Rosalinda, that doesn't really sound like Christian music. And she looks really surprised, and for a minute, I have this really sublime vision of her indigenous Mexican father leaned back in the minivan listening to Jay-Z. And I, I start to laugh a little, and I say, no, really, Rosalinda, what, what's going on? And she says, well, when she looks down at her food, she's totally embarrassed, and she says, well, my parents don't really understand English, so I just tell them that this is Christian music. And I start to laugh. I'm like, your, your parents think this is Christian music. She's like, yeah. And we laugh for a minute. And she says, but I don't know what I'm going to do. They're taking English classes. And when we finish laughing, you know, that chasm between their lives and mine, it's not gone. There's no way to make that go away. But for at least a minute, I'm grateful that I got to join my friend on the other side. Thank you.